Federal charges for the nation's longest serving House Speaker. What this means for Illinois' Democratic Party, public trust in state government, and for Michael Madigan himself. We dive into that and more in a special edition of Spotlight Politics with Amanda Venicky, Heather Sharon, and Paris Schutz. So just to recap, as Amanda reported, uh, U.S. Attorney of the Northern District of Illinois, John Lausch, announcing that former House Speaker Michael Madigan has been indicted. Lausch says it has been a long time coming. Here's a bit of how he says his team gathered evidence. We use a whole host of investigative tools. Those aren't spelled out specifically in the indictment, but what you do have um, are words that are used in conversations. You do have words that are used in, in documents or on emails that are spelled out throughout the indictment. And that's the core of our evidence in this case. It's the words that are spoken by people. It is the things that show up on documents. And those are the things that actually form the basis for the charges that we brought. Heather Sharon, any specific clues as to how investigators got Madigan? Well, we do know that some of the charges, specifically the ones where Michael Madigan is charged with using his public office to drive business to his private property tax firm, involve disgraced former alderman Danny Solis. Now, we know from reporting in the Chicago Tribune and other news organizations that Danny Solis was wearing a wire. And it's clear that some of those conversations took place with Michael Madigan, and some of those conversations are quoted in the indictment released today. Beyond that, it's not clear precisely how they got the evidence to support this indictment, because everybody had thought that Michael Madigan was too slick to be caught on tape, to include in a, a can, you know, an email where he was, you know, sort of participating in a criminal enterprise. So there is a lot of evidence in this case that has not yet been made public. And everyone wants to know exactly how the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Northern District of Illinois finally, finally brought an indictment against House Speaker Michael Madigan, former House Speaker Michael Madigan, I should say. And Paris, you know, we got this 106 page indictment uh, a few hours ago. What stands out to you? Well, where do you start, Brandis? But I'll, I'll start with the key line here that's saying the 22 count indictment accuses Madigan of leading for nearly a decade a criminal enterprise whose purpose was to enhance Madigan's political power and financial well-being while also generating income for his political allies and associates. So essentially saying his political organization, the 13th Ward political organization, probably the most powerful in the state for many years, was one giant criminal enterprise. It was one giant grift to enrich him and to make him powerful and to enrich his friends. The, the thing is, none of this is surprising to anybody that spent any time around state politics. Everyone knew that this was the dynamic with Madigan. This was the general way that he operated. Maybe they didn't know the specifics. Maybe they didn't have ironclad proof that he steered business to his law firm Madigan in Getzendanner. But he built power for a reason. And this, these were the tools, allegedly, that he used to build power. But as Heather said, the thing that everyone else also surmised was he was too slick. He's too circumspect. He doesn't use email. He's a man of very few words. So he covered all his tracks. Clearly, a lot of things changed, as Heather mentioned, Danny Solis, and then ComEd, the deferred prosecution agreement that that company entered into. Clearly, at least some of their principals are cooperating here and giving information that led to today's indictment. Clearly. So uh, one part of the indictment cites a conversation between Madigan and an older person about a company. The older person said, quote, I think they understand how this works. You know, the quid pro quo, the quid pro quo. Madigan said, quote, OK, very good. So, uh, Amanda, what's your reaction to, you know, what appears to be fairly clear communication about bribery? A man, a few words. OK, good. Uh, but everybody knows what quid pro quo means and does. I think for a long time there has been this notion, right, of sort of a chicken in the egg scenario when it comes to Madigan's power and then his private role as an attorney. Are people coming to him? Does he amass power? Does his blessings for recommending somebody for a job lead back to the fact that he holds very powerful positions such as that of House Speaker, Chairman of the Democratic Party of Illinois? Or is it the opposite, that he uses those positions to ingratiate himself, to get business for his law firm, to get allies, jobs and positions? Madigan is arguing that it is really the former, that this is politics. That's how it works. When you are Speaker of the House, people are going to ask you, who do you think I should 
hire for this government job? What do you think of this person, that that is part of the nature? The feds, of course, are arguing just the opposite, that it was just part of that conversation, a quid pro quo. So that is really what I think sticks out to me there. Also, as we are talking about this notion of Madigan, how careful he was, the lack of cell phone, knowing all the rules, having been, as I noted earlier, part of state government since 1970 and drafting the Constitution, and so really knowing the law inside and out, and therefore perhaps treading up to the line. This gets to, I think, a couple of things. First of all, the notion. Do you still want your elected officials to act in a particular manner, serving the public good, even if it isn't, per se, illegal? And also, how Madigan was using some of these, uh, apparently knowing the law, to do just that to sort of skirt it. The indictment details the use of third-party cell phones coded language. We know that McLean, one of Madigan, they served in the Illinois House together way back when, close friends, confidants, that McLean referred to Madigan as himself. So it appeared, it, the feds are making the argument that Madigan knew what he was doing was wrong and was intentionally doing what he could to try and evade the feds and investigators. And to that point, can I jump in and just say, like that quid pro quo, he, he says later allegedly in the indictment, don't use the words quid pro quo, by the way, Danny Solis. And that, that highlights the role of Danny Solis, a former alderman, chair of city council's zoning committee. So part of this alleged scheme was Solis, uh, developers come to Solis, they need a zoning change in this instance. Solis says, all right, well, if they want the zoning change, uh, they have to hire Madigan. And it's, you know, this alleged scheme here, Madigan in this indictment is a part of that. Clearly, Solis got messed up in his own problems federally. He cut this deal with the feds, and he has not faced any kind of prison time or anything like that, clearly because it ensnared Ed Burke and now uh, Mike Madigan. So Solis wearing a wire here playing a huge role. So the indictment, it cites instances, as we know, from just this past decade, though from 2011 up to 2019, though Madigan had been in power for much longer than that, Heather. As we know, um, are there any signs that this alleged corruption, that it spans further than what has been charged? Because we do know that the uh, USA said that the investigation is ongoing. So we don't know. We don't know that um, you know, if you read this indictment as sort of a full accounting of Michael Madigan's alleged criminal actions, it began just 10 years ago. But I think everybody is wondering, how could that be if he's been in power as speaker all but two years since 1983? How did it just start, you know, in 2009? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to, to most people. What struck me from this indictment as well was that they were able to put a dollar figure on, on what they say Madigan and his associates gained from that. And that totals $2.8 million. And I, I think it's not, you know, too, too important to stop and, and put a period on that because the U.S. Attorney's Office today alleged that essentially Madigan and his associates through a criminal enterprise stole that money from Illinois taxpayers. And we sometimes forget what well, with all of the politics and the drama that at the center of the deferred prosecution agreement that Commonwealth Edison signed was a scheme to raise electricity rates on Illinois residents. So that's sort of how all of this started and how how far back does it go? Nobody, I think, will ever really know. Who can tell? In recent years, Democrats have slowly started to come out against Madigan, but for years we know many have supported him and still do and did up until the day he uh, resigned. Uh, GOP lawmakers today, though, they held a press conference in response to this indictment. Uh, here's a bit from State Representative Tom Demmer of Dixon. The important message here today is that ethics require more than just not breaking laws that a culture of ethics in Springfield doesn't wait for an indictment to happen, but that we hold each other accountable, that we go through the appropriate process, and that we get the answers that we need when we need them. Going forward, Paris, do you expect to hear any conversations about Democrats, uh, their potential role in sort of allowing this to happen, considering that Madigan held so much power over them in their seats and their fundraising? 
Yes, I mean, that is the case that Durkin made, the Republican leader Jim Durkin made today. It's a case that Republicans in the middle of a campaign cycle here will probably try to make. And there are many Democrats uh, that jumped off the Madigan bandwagon. There was one, and then two and three and four kind of followed after that uh, once they kind of knew where this investigation was going. I also want to bring up one more point about this indictment. Mike McClain is also charged with these 22 counts, and he still has his own federal case, which basically he is charged uh, uh, in connection with the exact same alleged activities. And Lausch was asked that today. Why is McLean charged here when he's already charged? And Lausch didn't really answer, but the, the obvious implication here is he is the key witness here. They want him to flip, and they clearly haven't gotten him to do so yet. And, and so right now, I mean, the feds wouldn't bring a case if they didn't feel it was strong, but it's a stronger case if Mike McLean says, you know all this stuff? He made me do it. And his lawyer today is saying McLean's not going to do that. So he, the feds still, I think, they still think they want to tie up some loose ends with this case. Heather, Madigan is likely to put up a very strong defense, of course. Uh, what are you expecting as this case moves forward? Well, I'm really struck by the parallels with the criminal case facing Alderman Ed Burke. He has pled not guilty. We certainly expect Michael Madigan to plead not guilty. And they are essentially charged with some of the same criminal conduct, using their public office to drive business to their private property tax appeals firm. And in the, in Ed Burke's case, he is using his massive campaign war chest, which he is perfectly entitled to do to pay lawyers who have buried the government in a blizzard of motions and challenges that have dragged on this case for nearly three years at this point. And I expect Madigan is going to do exactly the same thing. I expect him to challenge the legality of the wiretap that we talked about with um, former Alderman Solis. And he can drag it out for a long time, perhaps as long as Ed Burke. It's hard to tell. But this is just sort of the opening salvo in what promises to be a long and bitterly fought criminal case. Amanda, I think I, I cut you off. I think you were jumping in. To do it. <laughs> oh, yeah, Brent. I was going to add to Heather that Madigan certainly has the campaign war chest to be able to do that, to be able to fight with fury in the courts against this. I also wanted to point out to what Paris said earlier. I mean, it is striking. Burke, of course, still in office. Madigan is not a committeeman, but he really does not have anywhere near the power that he once did. And so the 19 legislators, women, by the way, um, led this. They were the ones who jumped ship when it was a very scary thing to do and Democrats would be in a very different position had those 19 individuals not taken this leap and Madigan was facing these charges while still holding the positions of DPI chairman and Illinois House Speaker. Can I bring up one more thing? Elena Hampton, the young woman that I think three or four years ago came forward about sexual harassment allegations in Madigan's 13th Ward operation. Uh, from my vantage point, that was the first time we really saw chinks in the armor here uh, of Madigan because no one talked, no one challenged him, uh, and then she did. And after that, it's been all downhill for that organization. We don't know if, if, if that led to information that the feds got uh, that led to this indictment, but certainly it was the first time we really saw the wheels start to come off. Uh, so we've got about 45 seconds left. I'm going to give it to Heather. Illinois Senators uh, t uh, Dick Durbin and Tammy Duckworth, they lobbied uh, the president to keep Lausch in this position. Do you think they're seeing the fruits of their labor right now? They sure are. Both senators picked a very public fight with a newly inaugurated President Joe Biden back in January to say, don't fire Lausch, who of course was appointed by former President Donald Trump when Joe Biden fired all of the U.S. attorneys, as one normally does when a new president takes office. Durbin and Duckwith went to the president and they said, no, you've got to leave Lausch. There's too much going on with corruption in Illinois. And today, if nothing else, is a vindication indication of their argument that this case was almost there. Now, it doesn't seem like it was almost there more than a year ago, but that is how the U.S. Attorney's Office works. They move deliberately and slowly and not as fast as any of us in the news media would like, but it is a clear win for Durbin and Duckworth, and it could potentially mean that Lausch stays in office a little bit longer because nobody wants to change prosecutors in the middle of a high-profile case like not this. Like, not like this one. That's Spotlight Politics. Amanda Vinicky, warm-up. Heather Sharon. Parachutes. Thanks, everybody.